This is a live channels television event. Let me give you an example of why pension policy now has huge implications for a long time to come. Let me tell you about a lady called Gertrude Janeway. Now, Gertrude is an American. She died age 92 in 2003. And up until that date, she was still religiously getting her $70 a month pension, survivor's pension, widow's pension from her husband, who was a military veteran. The interesting thing about Gertrude is that her husband was a veteran, not of the First World War, not of the Second World War. He was a veteran of the American Civil War in the 1860s. And what happened was in the 1930s, during the Great Recession in the 30s, these very young girls were married to very old men to get their pensions. And Gertrude married her husband in 1930 when she was 18 and he was 82. So the last American Civil War pension was paid in 2003. So it's not just a 75-year issue, this spanned three centuries. So the policies you put in place today have huge long-run long implications. So think of Gertrude when you're doing your pension policy. Next slide, please. Um, now, Mr. Mohammed talked this morning about the pillars, the famous pillars of the World Bank, which you can split in many ways. But I think what's important from the messages we've been talking about today is, um, again, I can't reiterate too much, Mr. Sober said this morning about the, the East, from ESA, that the social security must fit the context of your country. That is so important. And everyone asks, apologies to the journalists in the room, the journalists always say, what's the best pension system? They always ask us this question too. I used to work at the OECD and we did these lovely charts comparing countries, and journalists love these comparisons. But you have to work on the context of where you are. And again, you can't pick up you know, the, the Kenyan pension system and put it into Peru, or the, the Swedish pension system and put it into Cote d'Ivoire. You have to fit the context. And this is why, all these, why we've expanded the concept of these pillars, is thinking holistically is very important. So you have the basic coverage from social protection, you have the employment base and the voluntary pillars, and then the fourth pillar, this is all about, do we have housing assets? Housing has come up a lot. Do we have, in India, they have a lot of savings in gold. I mean, all of these are important assets we need to think about, not just the pension, but what's the old age provision in general. And the fifth pillar is work. We have to also think about what does work mean? What does retirement mean? And we're doing more and more studies finding that keeping people working, maybe not nine to five, maybe not in a classic sense, but people keeping working and involved in the communities is actually very good for your mental health, your physical health. So the whole package is what we're saying is very important. Um, and that's why I think the pillars, and you can argue about how you fit them together, you can argue about what's best or not, but the thinking holistically is very important. Um, next slide, and I'll skip to the next slide, please. So, when you say, again, the journalists say, what's the best pension system? How do you measure, how do you think about whether your pension system is working? And again, I commend you all for having this debate 10 years on. How do you assess whether the system you have in place is working? Well, there's, um, Mr. Mohammed put up a slightly different set, but there's five key ways, I think, for thinking about how a system is working. One is the coverage, coverage, coverage kept coming up. Are we getting to the vulnerable elderly in our society? Number one job of the pension system. The second thing is adequacy. Are they getting enough, not just getting to them, but are they getting enough to keep them out of poverty? The third question, and what's interesting is that there are trade-offs here. I mean, you, can't, you can have a lot of coverage, but maybe you'll only be able to pay a lesser amount. But if you pay a large amount, the third one here is sustainability. If you give a, a big promise to lots of people, will you be able to pay for that in future? So sustainability, coverage, adequacy, they all are policy choices that you have to balance. And then security, um, this, is, this is a long-term savings. We're talking about long-term savings. So trust and security is very important. How secure are the assets you're asking people to save for a long time? And how efficient, dollar in, dollar out, how efficient is the system? And there's a lot of reforms going on in all these areas to improve all these areas. I think we can find across Africa which is great because it gives me excuses to come and visit you all. But there's a lot of reform going on. But let me just look at these five issues very quickly in the African context and see how we're doing. So the next slide, please. The first one is on coverage, coverage, coverage. We kept talking about this is why we are talking about coverage. So in Africa, you can see down the red bars down here, 
Where you have the universal social pensions are these big blips. Otherwise, it's not even one in 20, I think, is one in five is generous. It's one in 10 even. 10% 10 coverage is not unusual in many African countries. This is why we're talking about um, the coverage issue. And then given the demographics I outlined, why this is going to become more and more important. Next slide. And as you said, Mr. Sober said earlier, um, pensions, this is GDP per capita, pension coverage. Yes, coverage does go up with, with, with income. Yes, that's right. It does, as the country gets richer, coverage will go up. Um, but you can push yourself, good policy, you can push yourself over and, over and above uh, or below the line, and, and governance and all the issues you mentioned are very important for moving you over and above the line. Nigeria, I haven't got a pointer. Nigeria is just below, actually, and I would hope that some of the reforms in the new pension law will help you maybe pop back up over that line. I would think they're going in the right direction. Whereas some of the other countries, um, some of the Cap Verde is right up the top there, but some of them are actually above the line. So there are, you can see that policy impact does help on the coverage side. Next slide. The big issue is, as we've said, getting to the informal sector, particularly in the rural areas. Um, very tough for these contributory workplace schemes. And that's what we found in Latin America. I don't think Guillermo's here, but... In Latin America, and the reforms have found it's very hard to get coverage over about 50% through these employment-based contributory schemes. And the, the, the thought was that more, many firms would migrate from the informal to the formal sector, and that's happened less than was expected. So, you know, Regina and I were talking about the, coming back to work, coming back to the employment is very, very important. Coming back to jobs is very important when you're thinking about pensions. And again, Nigeria sits somewhere in the middle of that group. Some of the countries I'm working in, like Tanzania, Uganda, getting to the rural population is going to be very difficult. So I agree, getting to the informal sector is one of the key challenges we've all been discussing. But there are really interesting things happening around the world. And one of the things I think is important, when you talk about the informal sector, it's huge. What do you mean by the informal sector? And I think it really helps if you break it up. And then you might need to target different schemes. Who are you talking about? You have to have different schemes to target different groups to get, really get to this level of coverage. So it might be that you have um, very interesting social security, uh, the administration, as you're saying, very good administration in some countries. That can be used to reach out to informal sector. So our colleagues, I don't have any colleagues from Ghana here, but the social security fund in Ghana has been doing a good job on that, for example. Um, and then in India, they have uh, the new pension system, it's called, um, or talking about branding, NPS Light is what they've done, like Coke Light, NPS Light. And this is being used to reach out to informal sector. But what's interesting, it's through community groups. And they're using existing community groups to try and get them into the system. So that might be one way. And then you can have specific schemes targeted to specific groups. So, for example, agricultural workers can be a very big percentage of the population who are not covered. Um, our colleagues in Namibia, they have a scheme for, the inform for agricultural workers. China have done, talking about coverage, I mean, amazing job in getting uh, coverage up amongst agriculture and migrant workers. Very specific schemes they've designed with their needs in mind. You can debate the adequacy, back to the trade-offs, but the coverage actually has been improving a lot in China through these very specific schemes targeted at groups. Um, in Hong Kong, for example, they have a scheme that's for construction workers. So you might, you know, a lot of these workers move around. They work on one site one day. They work on another site another day. Uh, hotel catering workers, you know, people in catering might work for Hilton for a while. Then they might go and work for Sheraton. Scheme groups that can allow you to pay in according to where you're working. It might be a different employer, but a different industry. That can be one way to really help get coverage amongst workers who are coming in and out of sort of formal employment. And then finally, these schemes, we talked about Mbao a lot, which is great, and the technology that can be used to reach people. And then there's a very interesting experiment. I'm not sure it works very well, but I think it's a really interesting idea. Um, in Pakistan, of having prepaid cards, so a bit like your prepaid phone card, um, so prepaid contributions, so if you work for an employer for a while, they will give you like a prepaid pension contribution, you can then play into your pot. So these sort of interesting concepts, they are existing, I think we need to look at them more. And again, just like you said, Miriam, innovations coming from Africa, and I think we can learn a lot from some of the innovations across the continent here. Um, just back one, back one, please, yes, adequacy. Now, Another big debate and another big trend, which again we've sort of touched on in the last day or so, um, is social pensions. And there is a big wave at the moment of introducing these universal, non-contributory social pensions. 
Um, it's, it's a big wave in Africa, a lot of reforms in Africa, also in Latin America, it's a wave at the moment. The issue is how much, um, they, which is very good obviously for coverage, great for covering everybody. Um, the question is how much they pay. In most countries you get, is a low level, this is supposed to be minimum poverty alleviation. And I should say, pensions have two functions. One is poverty alleviation, and one is savings, consumption smoothing. And this is why we say with all these pillars, it's very important that you think about the two separately. And that's why we say in, in the bank's message has always been to have different pillars that can achieve these different functions. If you try to put them together in one, you're likely to fail with both. So separating out and having a basic minimum pension is very important. Um, and in many countries it's like 10%, something 20 to 20% of the minimum wage. So we're talking about a low level. But the issue is, even that can be quite costly. So we're talking about maybe one and one and a half percent of GDP. Doesn't sound like so much, but just as we were discussing yesterday, um, countries like Nigeria that have you know very tight government revenues, very low tax takes, that's a big percentage of government income. So next slide. The, the question is, what is the best way to get to the most vulnerable? And in some countries, um, it may well be through a university.